A very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. The podium, the stage is over here, this side of the room. Okay, if we can get our seats and get started, we'll, we'll move on to our, our fourth and final session for today before uh, the gala dinner and, and after glow party tonight. I want to thank you all for your participation today, for your engagement, discussion. Uh, we had a great think tech session in this room before. I heard the student session was fantastic, so i um, looking just to end on a really strong note here, or at the very least, keep you awake until we give you some beer in about an hour and a half and something, which is, which is what we've tasked our, our panelists with doing. Just a couple of um, reminders as we go into our, our final session. Um, directly after this session, as, as I just mentioned, is the rider-hosted gala dinner. So we'll have buses leaving uh, from the downstairs exit. That's the Marriott exit. So you take the, take the elevator down to floor one and then to the lobby, and we'll have buses uh, taking you to the Detroit Institute of the Arts. Uh, it's a fantastic venue. I'm sure those in Detroit need absolutely no introduction for that. But, but for those of you visiting, I think you're in for a treat. And, and then please stick around after that, because we're going to the opera. Um, except actually the arts and opera, except I'm not sure how much art or opera we're going to hear at all. It's basically going to be booze in a nice environment, but still. Um, uh, we'll have the Afterglow party hosted by Sujer after that. So, so a lot of great networking ahead of us, uh, and we still, like I said, have a great session in front of us. One more reminder, well, yet another reminder uh, about the conference app. And uh, we've, we've been kind of asking you to use this all day to kind of check the program and, and do some uh, ratings. At the end of this session, or towards the end of this session, we're going to do some live voting on the, uh, some industry trends and developments. So uh, we're going to really want you to log on to that, to download it, and, and, and to use the app for the voting. Just a reminder, again, uh, you can just get that, obviously, off, off the App Store or wherever you get your apps. And uh, you don't need to log in with anything. If, if you can just download it, and you'll get all the information. However, if you do log in, you get a, a delegate number. Um, you have the opportunity as well to view other delegates at the event. And um, uh, I think, actually, we had the same app developers who did Tinder, because if you go to the attendee page and you swipe right where you want to see someone, you, that, that's actually where you can then connect uh, with the people that you want to connect with. So just, just keep that in mind as we, we go into later in the evening, perhaps. But uh, anyway, that's all, up, that's all privately. That's for you. Um, so yeah, again, just, just do, do, do take the advantage to, to download that app. OK, so this session, designing future supply chains today, again, keeping with the theme of the conference throughout, we're, we're, we're taking, taking some time to look ahead. And we've got some great panelists to, to do that. Uh, just going back to something Louis mentioned at the beginning, we're, we're forward-looking, but we're also uh, celebrating a little bit right now at Automotive Logistics, because we did turn, did turn 20. And um, I know we look much younger, but, but we are now 20. And uh, we, we, we're actually launching a special anniversary edition in, in October. And uh, we've, we've interviewed a bunch of executives asking them about what's changed, what hasn't, and what is to come. Uh, and some of that kind of informs, I think, some of the discussions that we'll be having here. And in fact, that's, that's kind of what we're going to have you vote on at the end of the session. Um, you know, and I think some of those, those potential changes and developments, again, I don't think it's news to people in this room, but, but um, you know, we, we have executives telling us that we're seeing a supply chain increasingly complex, growing number of part numbers, more personalization, which is adding more, more dynamics into the supply chain, increasingly international. Um, with, with longer supply chains, shorter cycle times and, and product development times, which is putting, again, more, more pressure on the supply chain up and down. And, and, and of course, we're looking towards, towards technology and developments to, to help us manage that, to take advancements in, in, in big data, to, to become predictive and, and proactive with things like data analytics, um, to get closer to, to real-time visibility uh, and sort of, sort of reckon with the so-called Amazon effect, uh, which everybody really talks about, but, but particularly in, the, uh, in this industry, perhaps with the exception of, of aftermarket, um, I'm not always sure that, that, that it's really having much of an impact here. And this at a week when Toys R Us has joined uh, yet another list of retailers who, who have gone insolvent, and um, this disruption that is definitely happening in the wider distribution world and the wider retail, maybe not yet in automotive, but but I think we'd be naive if we didn't think that that disruption isn't, isn't 
around the corner in one form or another. And um, clearly, I think, as we talked about with Brandon this morning, uh, Brandon Mason, um, autonomous, electric, some of these things are going are gonna to shake up the traditional industry that, that, that we see. And, and I think logistics, logistics will, as always, have an important role to play in that and the ways that it will change. Um, uh, we, can, we can often see some of the, some of the shapes of that change, but, but maybe not being put into place just yet. Part of that complexity outside the technology is also around regulations. It's also about trade, trade agreements. We have the NAFTA negotiation, renegotiation happening right now. We talk about supply chains that cross the border seven or eight times um, uh, between raw material and a finished product. And, um, and obviously, we're not sure what's going to happen now. It's something that we can actually talk about a bit in this session uh, with, one of our, with one of our panelists. So um, lots, of, lots of change, lots of uncertainty but as ever, opportunity as well. So um, with that, I'd like to, to introduce um, our panelists. We're going to have typical format. We'll have a couple of slides from each of our panelists, and then we're going to move as quickly as possible into Q&A. We had a slight change in the program. Um, Mr. Alcipanta couldn't, couldn't make it from the US-Mexico Chamber of Commerce, but we're very fortunate to have um, Rogelio Landon, who's the executive director of the, I think, newly formed Detroit chapter of the, of the United States-Mexico Chamber of, of, of Commerce. And Mr. Landon is someone who has plenty of, of experience as well on the NAFTA side, and I think will be able to give us some, some insight into what, what we might expect there. Um, very pleased to, to have Kevin Hogan, uh, executive director from EY, talking to us about, again, supply chain change and digitalization. And, and Gary Allen, vice president of supply chain excellence from, from Ryder, able to kind of give us some, some views on how the supply chain is changing from third party logistics perspective. So again, please get ready to ask questions. You can use the app as well um, to send those questions if you don't want to put up your hand. But I'd like to invite Mr. Landon to the, to the podium now. Thank you. Good afternoon, and congratulations on what I understand has been a great conference. Um, I'm honored and privileged to join you, uh, and I am here, uh, again, as you're, my name is Rogelio Landin. Uh, this is actually my first day on the job as executive director for the U.S.-Mexico Chamber, Great Lakes chapter. Uh, so uh, th this is my inaugural address for you all. First, uh, I bring you greetings and regrets on behalf of our binational president, Mr. El Zapanta, uh, of the U.S.-Mexico Chamber. Uh, he's, uh, he was called to Mexico in, uh, you know, behind the earthquake incident and all that's going on over there. Uh, we just ask that you uh, send up some prayers and for all those adversely affected. And we know we've all had our share of uh, hurricanes and floods and torrential winds and so forth uh, as well. So let's just pray for all our folks and, and hope that uh, they find their way back quickly. Um, Lewis asked me to touch a lot on a little bit about NAFTA, and uh, I think the fundamental, it, the fundamental importance of our relationship. Uh, and given that this is the automotive logistics, uh, it's worth noting that the Great Lakes chapter will be focused on automotive manufacturing uh, as such, and that we're, that's what we're going to be committing ourselves to uh, as a chamber. For those companies who are interested in bilateral, binational trade and commerce in the automotive manufacturing sector. Uh, a little bit about um, why I'm here and I guess how I got here is that I was around for the first round of NAFTA. Uh, I was uh, involved in consulting with the bridge loan of Mexico and the World Bank with the entry and the passage of Mexico into the GATT then, now the World Trade Organization, uh, and all of the economic and financial um, things that were happening with regard to the crisis of the peso, and the lessons to be learned uh, when you operate uh, in, in a vacuum in terms of your economy uh, and, and try to function within closed economies. There's a textbook uh, case study there for anybody 
who wants to learn what can happen when you don't participate in global international trade. Um, that said, without getting into resumes and extensive history, we have a little bit of time here. Um, I would say this about the current state of the so-called renegotiation um, of NAFTA. This, to me, is almost deja vu. Uh, the discourse, the similarities of the dynamics, um, the elections coming up in Mexico, which I think will serve to slow the process, um, as is with any impending change in administration of any country, when you're winding down, and the thing with Mexico's elections, uh, if you don't know, the president gets one six-year term, so there's no re-election. So you, you can count on a new administration every six years. Uh, so not a lot happens during that elec election period uh, with the understanding that a new administration obviously will bring new people in and, and do what they do. Um, so that's, that's where we're at. Uh, that election takes place next summer in less than a year. Uh, so it, it's, it's uh, understandable not to expect a whole lot of movement, at least on Mexico's side. That will then take us into the 2019 campaign cycle, which takes us into 220. Uh, and, and we know that you know, they'll be in full campaign mode then. That said, I, I, just me, I don't see a lot substantively happening until 2021. The good news is, is that in the interim, we have plenty of opportunity to revisit NAFTA, assess it, evaluate it, seek out where improvements can be made, and expand to include critical elements to trade, like technology and security, which, weren't, uh, which were essentially non-existent issues when the original was drafted, uh, and especially as it relates to logistics, which provides a value proposition of efficiencies uh, and time. At the end of the day, revisions will be driven by economics. And I think that's what drives all of the business decisions that we all make uh, going forward. Today, NAFTA is exponentially so much more than a continental agreement. It is, by extension, a hemispheric agreement with Mexico serving as the gateway to every trading block in South America and beyond. And uh, just consulting real quick with our friends at Google, just to touch on the relationships and the interdependency of these relationships, especially between the United States and Mexico. Uh, permit me to read, the United States has free trade agreements in effect with 20 countries. By comparison, Mexico has a network of 10 free trade agreements with 45 countries, 32 reciprocal investment promotion and protection agreements with 33 countries, nine trade agreements, economic complementation and partial scope agreements within the framework of the Latin American Integration Association. That, my friends, is a lot of value, value add to the free trade agreements we have in the US. So I do not forecast nor foresee, once somebody sits down and does the numbers, and that's really what we all do at the end of the day, it's about the math, we'll recognize the value in not only retaining what we have as a present infrastructure of NAFTA, but build on it, improve it, expand it, add to it, bring in and add those things that were missing and weren't really issues back then, incorporate them so that we can have a stronger NAFTA going forward so that all of us can grow and prosper. I want you to know that the U.S.-Mexico Chamber is committed to facilitating, facilitating that growth, in particular the growth of its members. 
With that, I am going to make a shameless invitation to each and every one of you to join our chamber and explore how we can add value to your business if you're presently doing business with Mexico, and if not, but you may be interested in doing business with Mexico, or someone who is doing business with Mexico, we can make a lot of that happen. With that, uh, I will give you my email, which is my name altogether at yahoo.com. I don't yet have my official USMCOC email yet. And I'll give you my personal cell number, 313-506-6627. I am on 24-7, and I am here to serve partners like you and like the Global Logistics Conference. Thank you so much, Chris, Lewis, each and every one of you for your time. I hope some of this has been helpful looking forward. Take this. You just gave him the number, so you don't want to. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so unfortunately, Mr. Lennon has to has to has to leave. Um, but we do appreciate you you coming in and giving us the, this this message. I think it. Um, we can put that back on that. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think the message there is 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 clear with the importance of 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 NAFTA. Um, and for those of you who, who may have been in Baltimore with us last month, if not, I would encourage you to, to look at the presentation, and we'll send another link out um, that, that Mrs. Zapanta gave there about some of the, the detail um, happening. And, and Mrs. Zapanta, actually, who was giving speeches on both sides to, to both sides of the negotiating table um, uh, regarding the renegotiation. So, so a lot of, a lot of important things happening there. And again, we echo the, the sentiments and the thoughts um, for the for the victims of the of yesterday's terrible earthquake as well, um, we'll we'll come back onto some of that some of that in the Q and A. But uh, I'd like to invite Kevin Hogan from EY. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And uh, before I start, I wanted to just um, make note, score one for the conference for the networking value here. Gary and I worked together several years ago, and I had no idea until I saw the, the um, agenda, speaker's agenda, a few days ago that we were gonna be up here together. So it's great to see him, and it's a, good, uh, it's a good reminder of the networking value here. We also just decided we're gonna stretch out our comments as long as possible, if there's just gonna be two of us for Q&A for 30 or 45 minutes. <clears throat> Not in our best interest. So what I wanted to uh, talk about today was the role of digital. The, the theme for this session is designing a supply chain for the future. But I wanted to talk about the role of digital in that. And I think as you'll go through this, um, the perspective I share may not be exactly what is going through your minds right now. And um, that's my, my teaser on this. What, um, what we really want to, um, to talk through is how do you effectively introduce digital technology to your supply chain? But let's back up for a minute and talk about digital technology. You know, the word digital is kind of a nebulous word. It's, it means different things to different people. We've been digitizing our supply chain for decades, right? And so, you know, one model look at this is to kind of look at it in eras. The automation era, um, you could say was, um, you know, kind of the first step in, in digital technology applied to the supply chain. The examples on this slide I, I realize are product oriented, but if you apply this same digital technology era concept to the supply chain, maybe I would say automation represents the introduction of MRP, or at least the, the penetration of MRP. You know, it was the first time there was a system to help blow out a bill of material instead of um, analysts crunching through that, right? It was doing the same thing, but doing it more efficiently. Fast forward to maybe around the 90s when you get into you know, what's called here digitization. Um, and there what you're talking about is basically converting something that, that was analog to digital. Here, you're, a lot of this would have been underpinned by the ERP you know, the rise of the ERP and the penetration of ERP systems. Um, you know, this is when EDI became ubiquitous and all of a sudden we converted a, a, a paper 
um, 850 into, or I mean a paper PO into an 850, right, um, through EDI. So we were now doing something um, that was previously analog in a digital fashion, and, and so there was faster communication and better integration with systems. What we're talking about now, the, the, the middle portion there of the van, is um, essentially an era where we're doing entirely new things that weren't possible, um, capabilities that didn't exist before. Um, you know, blockchain is one that's had some discussion earlier, and um, I'm gonna touch on that a little later. Quite honestly, I haven't seen, I've seen blockchain in automotive, I haven't seen blockchain in automotive supply chain, and, and so something I'll, I'll tease from the audience here when we get to Q&A is if someone has some experience with that, um, I'd love for you to speak up, I'd love to have some dialogue around that. But blockchain represents capabilities um, that simply didn't exist. Augmented reality may be another one, I mean imagine a, um, uh, a picker running around a distribution center, I mean, far from needing pick lists, they're not even using a terminal on their high-low. They're, they're literally using a, um, an augmented reality tool that tells them where and what it looks like and so forth. And so these kind of digital technologies aren't like the ERP phase of the 90s. This is a whole different capability enablement um, era that we're in. So, you know, you hear a lot of talk about this era of rapid innovation and, you know, it's best to fail fast and learn and get on to the next thing. And I absolutely support all those ideas. However, what I want to share with you today through a couple of, of real life stories, or real life examples working with, with automotive supply chain organizations is that I, I agree with that concept, but you got to pilot something that holistically addresses a business challenge. Um, and previewing this a little, you know, I've seen multiple examples of, um, you know, organizations chasing a technology, chasing a pilot that didn't really have a good, that didn't really have a good design around it. I mean, where were you going with this? And um, so what I want to share with you is some thinking around as your supply chain transforms, as you look at supply chain design for the future, what and how to introduce digital technology. One more contextual slide, which is, you know, a lot of this digital technology introduction and disruption that's happening is creating some forces that are creating a lot of this chaos, but also this opportunity. And I think most of these are self-explanatory. Deep materialization may be the exception. Yeah, that's a, that's a real word, actually. It comes from the securities industry, and it's, it was a term that was coined when they moved, um, you know, security, stock ownership from a piece of paper to an electronic ledger, um, that was dematerialization. We've abstracted that concept here to say, what, you know, what capabilities does it bring to disconnect your people and your process from material? And material could be hard copies, material could be machines, infrastructure. What if I don't, what if I'm running around, a, back to my distribution center example, what if I'm running around to DC and I don't have to always run back to my terminal to, to, um, to log a pick, right? Um, dematerialization, disconnecting from, from the physical. Uh, these, four, these four forces, to a great degree, kind of sum up a lot of what we see impacting the, um, the automotive supply chain of today. You probably don't think about it in these terms, but, but these are the forces that we see behind a lot of the digital technologies. So, one of, the, um, one of the most immediate issues that I'm pretty sure every, everyone in industry in here is dealing with, and we talked about it at length in the think tank that I sat in, was this new era of collaboration where things are faster, there's more data flying around, there's, there's pressure from this business partner to collaborate or integrate, um, but my organization may not be ready or we may not know how to do that. You know, we're very much moving from a traditional linear supply chain or value chain as Srini from JDA earlier today described it as a matrix. I think my kids would describe my model as a fidget spinner model. But the idea is that it's not linear anymore. There's, um, there's collaboration with business partners all up and down the value chain that you probably didn't five years ago, certainly 10 years ago, didn't have a whole lot of, of integration with. 
And I'll give you a, a quick story there of uh, a supply chain organization who um, kind of had a false start. Maybe they would characterize it as a fast fail in retrospect. But they're a part manufacturer, but they sell mostly to the aftermarket retail chains rather than the OE channel. They, uh, they had recently purchased and, and stood up a new advanced planning tool. And um, in that channel, the, um, the, the big aftermarket retail groups can be pretty influential, pretty powerful business partners, particularly on a smaller part manufacturer. So long story short, there was tremendous pressure on this, on this organization to um, start pulling in this point of sale data from the retailer. And the retailer was saying, look, we've got other, your competitors are doing this with us and we've seen, we've seen step change in, our, in, in their fill rates and their service levels. And this company didn't really know what to do with that, but they went ahead and pulled this data in and linked it right up, I mean, fed it right into this new forecasting tool that they had implemented within the last year. And you can imagine where that went. There was no analysis of the data. There was really no design around how to use that forecast input as an enrichment. Um, and there, it was a mess. I mean, their, their forecast accuracy went backwards. So they reached out for help. We sat down and said, you know, what are we trying to achieve here? What's the holistic business challenge? We turned off the feed to the forecasting system and said, why don't we pull that into an analytics platform and let's see what we can learn. And so over a few months time, what we did by looking at that point of sale data, which by the way, I mean, we were nowhere near ready to use that for forecasting when you consider there were nodes in between. I mean, there were distribution centers on the manufacturer side, the retailer had their own DCs, there's order quantities, order intervals, order multiples, and we're feeding this retail POS data right into a manufacturing forecast. Not that simple. However, what we did um, come out with in the end, which was more of an analytics play and then became an enrichment in their forecast, was the ability to better predict ramp up, product ramp up, new part ramp up. That had always been kind of a gut feel kind of thing for this company. And they now had the ability, they created three different models for different parts and part characteristics to say how fast or how steep would the ramp up curve be. And that was virtue of this information that without an analytics platform, there's your digital play, they wouldn't have been able to do anything with. But their first foray into using this data and, and plugging it in because, you know, offense to software vendors, I'm sure the software vendor said, sure, you know, we have open APIs, you can plug that right in here. Disaster, right? So you need to start with a holistic solution. At the end of the day, digital technologies are going to be integral for this, this higher level of integration that um, keeps coming up in session after session. There's no question about it. And the integration in your core processes is where this is going. But you know, my caution is that um, you're, at the end of the day, with all the great new technology that's out there, you still have to solve for a business opportunity or a business issue, business challenge. And maybe one of the differences now with some of the disruptive technology that's so enabling in new ways, maybe you have to bring that to the table sooner than you would before. Maybe it's not design this model, design this process, design this in, in a bit of a vacuum and go look for technology. Maybe it's more of a, a partnership, but it's absolutely not chasing the bells and whistles of the digital technology. Um, you know, I'll mention the blockchain example that I, uh, I was fishing for earlier. The blockchain example that I have seen in automotive that was just stood up in the last couple of months is mobility as a service. So the shared ledger portion is the fleet pool. And the insurance provider was actually the, the, the real impetus for getting this done because they wanted to make sure that cars were being um, properly taken care of. But, you know, the members, the, the ultimate fleet owner, the, um, the fleet management company, the insurance company, all of those, all of those um, companies as well as the transactions for these customers to pay for their usage is all managed on the blockchain. So there are real-life examples. I mean, that's a real-life production example. Um, and I think we're just on the verge of figuring out how to do that in the logistics space. In the think tank, we had a good discussion about, you know, losing visibility at the part level, particularly on long, you know, ocean freight, long-term, 
shipments, um, is there a blockchain opportunity there, right? I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm not certainly the blockchain technology expert, my brain's probably not big enough to, to figure that out, but I, I think that that's the kind of example where you've got multiple parties, you need a single source of the truth, you need multiple parties involved in this who all have a slightly different interest. There's some transaction value to this, um, so it feels like there's an opportunity there. The, um, the last, uh, this is the last slide and the last um, example I wanted to share, a story I wanted to share, um, is around this holistic nature, people, process, and technology. We've been hearing about solving problems and, and implementing systems well, since business systems were invented, I think, the, the mantra always was you need to bring pre people, process, and technology together. Well, that doesn't change in this new era. With these new disruptive technologies, that's still absolutely, um, absolutely the truth. And I'll give you a quick example. This is very recent, 2017 work uh, that I've been doing with a, uh, a new vehicle distribution company or division. This division is... Uh, they run um, vehicle processing centers and then distribute out to the, the dealerships in their region. Very manual processes there. I mean, they literally have, you know, in any given day, they have three or 4,000 cars on the lot and, um, and work orders, when the vehicle rolls off the rail car, there's a printed work order put on, put on the dash of the car. That's the work order. God forbid it blows away, right? There's, it's, it's, it's tied up in a, um, in a mainframe system. There's no, there's no um, trackability for these vehicles. So if a dealer needs to, wants to expedite a car, I can sell this car. If you can get me this model with this trim tomorrow, you know, they send a runner out through the parking lot looking for that color, that trim. Uh, I'm, uh, it's a horrendously slow and, and painful process. Their cycle time is about three days through the vehicle processing center. And the workflow through that is essentially, I, I call it a visual Kanban. I mean, these runners, um, which is, I mean, that's not a skilled role. You're, you're basically driving vehicles around. They literally just park vehicles at the shortest queue in front of a shop. I see on the work order, most, mostly it's not, it's not sequential in nature. I can do leather before or after I do wheels. There's a shorter line at wheels. I'm going to park this vehicle there. That's fine for, for the standard flow, I suppose, but dealers more and more frequently are calling, asking to expedite a vehicle. I can sell this car. If you can, if you can you know, promise to me that you can get it here tomorrow morning, accessorize this way. And so it sends this distribution unit into a, a, a complete scramble, and very often they can't get the car there on quite the, on quite the timeline that the, the dealer promised the customer. So it's a source of strain. So to you know, kind of get to the, the punchline here, the company did a kind of a false start where they thought the real value here was locating the vehicles. And so they, they went with these OBD plug-in devices, GPS kind of thing, so you could always you know, figure out where the car was. Um, that was great, you could figure out where the car was, but what they hadn't really looked at was the holistic business problem. Because if you look at this three-day cycle time, as much of the problem, much more of the problem, I should say, was delay time between shops as it was chasing vehicles around. And so they realized after much, much um, frustration that this wasn't getting them any better results. And so they pulled the plug on this pilot, and we came in and sat down and said, what are we really trying to do? We're trying to collapse the cycle time? Okay, let's look at the whole workflow. And so the moral to the story is there's about three different what I would consider you know, new digital technologies that have been introduced in this scenario. Um, they now have a, a dynamic work order delivered to these runners on a mobile device. So the work order is directing them where to go. You're not having this runner just decide which shop to park the car out of in front of. Um, there's actually some, some thought and design given to the, the workflow, the shop level workflow. Um, and that's done through um, a mobile delivered work order rather than these paperwork orders on the dash. They are still using GPS devices because it's still important to know where the, the vehicle itself is parked. Um, and the third thing they're, they're doing is they've invested in a lot of integration that didn't exist prior. So as part of that, they're now um, better integrated with their carriers so that the dealer 
has that visibility all the way until the car shows up on their lot. And so it's another example, again, like I say, of um, stepping back and looking at your business challenge or your business opportunity holistically before you get too enamored with the digital technology and, and diving in. I suspect I've, I've probably gone over time here, so I'm going to stop there and uh, hand it back over to Chris. As you said, Kevin, there's just more time for Q&A, so we'll, we'll come back on to that. No, but, but thank you. I think that was a, a great overview. I saw a lot of people scrambling to take notes and take iPhone photos and stuff. Just to remind you, we will send a link early next week and, and distribute the presentations that, that are you know, allowed to go be publicly accessed. So we will, you will get the presentations as well, so you can, you can get to study those in a bit more detail. Uh, I think we, we saw some of the key, the key trends and, and sort of technologies there, but uh, that, that sort of emphasis on, on not being kind of or googly-eyed about the, the shiny new toys and to think through the business processes. Uh, I think that's an important message and, and one in which um, the, the holistic nature of a whole business needs to be considered. So we'll come back to more of that uh, in the Q&A. But now for a couple of, couple of slides and more thought starters, Gary Allen from Ryder. All right, thank you. All right. Is everybody still awake? You ready for drinks? Who's been to uh, the Detroit uh, Art Institute? If you haven't been there, you should go. It's a really, really, really cool place. And the best news is uh, Detroit never sold off uh, all the artwork in there. That's probably the most important thing, besides coming out of bankruptcy. Christopher, a special thank you for being this you know, great draw right before drinks and dinner. I do appreciate that. Kevin and I uh, made a goal before we got up there. Uh, and presented all of you around how many buzzwords we can rattle off in an hour and a half. And so at the end, instead of doing polling in general, we should do a little bit of uh, buzzword bingo at the end, okay? Um, I only have a few slides. I mean, this is Q&A, right? So it's up to you to ask questions at the end, and if you won't, I'm sure Christopher will. But, um, you know, I think Kevin touched on a lot of the uh, points that I do want to emphasize today. And the topic around supply chain design, digital, transformation, platform. Everybody's got a platform. Everybody's got new technology. But I just want to highlight maybe a few things that are a little bit different now. Every year, it moves even faster. The thing that keeps me up at night as a 3PL service provider is how can you keep up with the pace of change? And that change is moving very, very fast. I think oftentimes we make it about technology. I think technology is certainly an enabler and a key element of it. But there's other things I want to kind of talk through that we've learned along the way, and we're still in the middle of kind of this journey as well. But the first piece is customer expectation, right? Everybody wants it, they want it now. It used to be that, hey, if I get it to you, you know, one week, one month, I'll get you a report. But now it's up to the second and minute, and everybody wants to see it on their phone. And it needs to be real time, right? And on, in the trade show, the expo, there's a lot of cool gadgets, cool toys out there that we'll talk through. But that speed is not going to go, slow down, right? So I think the challenge for all of us is what do we need to do differently to be able to accommodate those requirements? The second piece, and, and we talked a little bit about NAFTA early, earlier on, earlier sessions had the Internet of Things. I mean, it's like we're starting all over, right? This industry, we spent years developing AIG, getting the standards in place, and basically all those standards are kind of shifting, right? So how can we keep up with the regulatory changes, how do we implement enough standards to be able to address the changes without slowing it down? And then also things around resources, right? We have some of the mandates around ELD, so there's going to be a big impact on drivers. Uh, people in general, hiring and recruiting is certainly a challenge as well. So the regulatory pieces aren't changing. I think that's going to even get more dynamic going forward. Kevin touched on the holistic need. You know, I first, anybody here of CAPS Logistics Toolkit? Got to have a few of you. I know I'm dating myself. I've been doing this for over 30 years. So, you know, by trade, I'm a supply chain solution design person. I run at Ryder, our supply chain excellence team, but it's made up of engineers. But my team's remit is to focus on how to either design the most optimal solution or drive more savings and continual benefits for our customers while trying to keep an eye on new products capabilities. I first learned on CAPS Logistics Toolkit, you had to take this dongle thing and plug it in the back of your computer. I think this was 1992, 
and the thing had to run for about three, four days. I'm not kidding you. I think General Motors was the biggest project. Is Jim Zumian in here? Jim, Jim remembers it. I was on the other side. Jim was my customer at GM back in those days. I literally was looking at GM's entire network, trying to design in a CAPS logistics toolkit that would take four days to run, and it would take forever. Now what's changing, not only is it the sensor technology, but it's the, the modeling capabilities, right? Where we used to look at a network every quarter, every year, now you should be looking at every day. You should be looking at the flow of material and how that impacts your decisions around either sourcing as well as impact on transportation. So the tools are changing, but to Kevin's point, it's hard to look at it in one compartment. If you only look at it as transportation without the warehousing, without the inbound materials flow, without you know, outbound distribution, you're sub-optimizing. So the tools are getting more sophisticated, but taking a more holistic approach is pretty important. The other piece is there's a lot of new startups, and I don't know about all of you in this room, but every year, every minute, there's a friggin' new startup that starts up right now. And if I get one more email from my bosses and internal around, hey, check this company out, I mean, there's literally thousands and thousands of startups. And the cool thing is people are actually excited to be in this industry again, kind of went through a bit of a dip, but now if anybody's been out in California, Silicon Valley, they actually care about logistics now. They never gave a crap about logistics. And what's driving it is the automobile, right? And the autonomous vehicle that's cascading into autonomous trucks, right? So the fun part about it is there's a lot of startups in this space. The sad part is half of them won't be around, you know, next year, right? Or even six months from now. So there's a lot of noise, but good noise in a way. If, if any of you haven't affiliated yourselves with different accelerators, there's a lot of different companies that will bring companies to you. I recommend looking into it. You know, that's one thing that we're trying to do is try to have companies bring ideas to us. Um, I already talked about the planning capabilities. The rapid technology advancements, yep, I mean, it's out there today. Um, you know, everybody wants transparency and visibility, and that's where it starts. Because if you don't know where your stuff is, you don't know where your assets, you don't know where your inventory is, you really can't optimize anything. So, you know, everything's shifting in the cloud, which again, accelerates the speed aspect of it. But it's a big shift for companies to kind of figure out how to deal with the cloud, how to deal with security issues, and then still satisfy internal requirements. So a lot of change. I mean, it's not a different issue. What I'd say is there's a lot of change and noise around there. Uh, one thing, and this is just an example of ways we're trying to address some of these challenges. We launched an initiative about a year ago. We call it Ride or Share. But to me, it's a platform, so there's a, a buzzword for you. And it's also looking at a collaborative ecosystem, so another buzzword. But really at the core of this is understanding what the customer needs are. And then as Kevin mentioned, what is the problem you're trying to solve for and kind of work backwards, right? So the customer at top. But what we're trying to do is we're trying to leverage our core capabilities. Ryder has a lot of trucks. We have a lot of assets. We have a lot of warehouse. How can we use that better to drive efficiencies on behalf of our customer? But it does start with knowing what you have and where you have it and what you're going to do with it. And so that's kind of the starting point. Key to this, and you can't really see it in the slide, and Kevin talked a lot about it, is that platform in between. That everybody wants to own their platform, and if I hear that term one more, and I'm going to keep saying it myself, everybody's got a platform. So what do you go? You go to a platform for JDA because that's the latest TMS. Well, they got their own platform. Well, you go to a WMS provider. You go to ERP. I use SAP. End of the day, I don't care what execution system it is, right? All of us in this room, whether you're a manufacturer, provider, supplier, you need to own your own data. So the critical thing that we learned is we need to not only own the data, we need to manage the integration points to make it easy and quick to do business with in a very neutral way. So I don't care if we don't operate everything. I don't care who operates it, but you need to, eat to, you need to be easy to do business with. And so that was a big part of what we worked on is how do you perfect kind of that platform piece so it makes who executes what a little bit more neutral. The other piece is the amount of data, right? There's a million toys next door. The sensor technology is only going to get cheaper, right, which also drives what you have, where you have it around visibility. But managing that data is, is huge. It's a, it's a big issue, right? And you can get really bogged down with understanding what to look at and what data and what we do is we try to pick out one problem and solve for that at a time. The other, other side is the role of analytics, 
We'll talk about that, right? A lot of people don't even understand what analytics really is. But that job is not necessarily an IT job. It's somewhere in between business and IT. And how do you transform that data so operationally you can make better decisions? And then, as I mentioned before, what core capabilities do you have around leveraging, whether it's a truck, a person, a warehouse, to be able to bring value back to the customers? Right? And so that was kind of our objective of rolling out RiderShare. And we're still on the journey. I was a year old. But just to kind of summarize, just a few things to keep in mind, and we'll open up for Q&A. The first is start with the customer. Anything you're trying to do, if you wake up in the morning, you get bogged down with conference calls and things you're working on, if it doesn't affect the customer, I change what you're working on. The second thing is what strengths do you have? I, I gave reference to our assets and our trucks, and we have a lot of them, right? We also buy a lot of freight, right? So that's kind of what we're trying to leverage. But then how do you then extend that back to your customer? I already talked about the platform. If you haven't started on it, worked on it, you need to own your own platform, and that allows you to do business with anybody. And then the, the concept of collaboration is not new. I would say that you, know, you can't do it by yourself, whether it's a software provider, whether it's a consultancy, whether it's a supplier, a 3PL, whoever that partner is. I think the thing that's changing is people are open to working together, right? And, and even in auto, everybody's now open to sharing, collaborating, sharing warehouses, sharing trucks. But we see that continuing in the future and even more important in the future. And then last piece is what are you doing with data? Right? How are you transforming your company? How are you using that data to drive decisions? My goal with my analytics team is to train every operator so they could do it on their own. That's a long haul, right? So using data to drive decisions in everything you do is kind of the objective of what I'm working on now. So just a few thoughts as we go into Q&A. So with that, back to you, Christopher. Yeah. Thank you, Gary. And I think maybe it's a bit of a buzzword marathon, but I do think that uh, I, I, I think that they're all they're all key key aspects here. I mean, we can say the word analytic, data analytics all day all day. No, apparently I can't even say the word, let alone understand it. Um, but you know, we, we need to understand what this really means in, in our business, uh, in our in, in our actual businesses. And I think this. When I was doing these interviews for our 20th anniversary issue, this idea of the interface came up again and again. I think it was probably the most popular thing I was hearing from executives. We need an interface across systems. We almost even need logistics managers to be in interfaces themselves, need to be the, the point that, that gathers together the data and, and coordinates it. So um, all, all very important. Uh, we, have, we have plenty of time now for, for Q&A. We have about, about half an hour if we want to take that much. Um, Again, the floor, this is your conference, so, so do take the opportunity to, to, talk to, to talk to our panel or indeed uh, talk amongst yourselves as, as such. Um, again, our own data analytics show that you are very shy in the beginning, so I usually need to, uh, in a proactive way, get us sort of started. Um, and what, one of the things that came out quite a bit from one of the earlier sessions on, on designing, the, the other designing future supply chains today session, which was focused on the tier supply chain, um, was indeed this, this data integration aspect. And um, um, I mean, who, who, who in the end is going to be the integrator here? I mean, for an OEM, do they need to actually make that investment to, to pull all the connecting? Because as we know, there's already a prolif proliferation of systems. The, the 3PL like Rider needs to have its own platform because it's managing so much, so much this data. So who takes the initiative here? And, and, and where, you know, what's the stumbling box? Because if I hear another company complain that they can't do what Amazon does without doing something about it, you know, so. I, my take on that would be that um, there's, more than one layer of this. I think to a great degree, practically, when you're talking about the upstream supply, you are going to see that driven by the OEM. And it's a question of resources and capability and capacity and so forth. But I think perhaps downstream of the OEM, uh, that integration might be different. It might be driven by you know, innovative logistics providers. And it's not about them being the, the biggest player in that part of the value chain. It's about them being the most aggressive at finding, um, unlocking new value through you know, better integration. Your customers are constantly asking you for visibility to where are my parts, where's my product. Um, a lot of those questions probably land many times at, at, at sort of the, the service provider. So I, I think it's, you know, I think yes, the OEM, but I don't think it's exclusively there. I think there's, um, pieces of this, depending on 
what part of the value chain you're looking at. Yeah, no, I, I would agree. I think everybody has a role, right? I mean, I, I do think the OEM certainly has the most influence. If I'm an OEM, I want to own my own platform. I mean, everybody has to have their own integration layer. I mean, it's kind of like when we started with EDI, we're going through the same cycle. The issue is there's not really standards in place. So role of AIAG and then everybody in this room to work together to kind of develop those standards will be important. Um, so I think it really relies on all of us in, in this ecosystem. Mm. <laughs> Strike one. <laughs> yeah, Ding, we'll do a little, we'll have a little beer count for how much you have to <laughs> drink for every buzzword that comes up. Um, the, kind of kind of following up on, on, on that, um, well, I had a point and then it just left. Um, any other questions from the audience while I recover mine? No. Um, How about to my question earlier about blockchain? Yeah. Has anyone had any exposure, even if it was just, you know, kind of a business partner is doing something? I mean, has anyone seen any of that um, coming into our auto supply chain space yet? So um, blockchain we there is so an, I'm not behind the curve then. No, not really. I mean, we have an article <laughs> in our in our. I think it would be it will be in your delegate packs. Um, the current mm -hmm. issue of Finnish vehicle logistics, looking at the potential for, for blockchain, and I don't think we've come across too many use cases. But yeah. I mean, so Daimler's doing something, but I think it's mm -hmm. in their finance aspects, which touches yeah. purchasing, but not necessarily the logistics side. Um, but I think company. I mean, Rude. I, I think Inform has perhaps been looking closely at this. So maybe you might want to. Uh, give us uh, some comment on that. If we can give the mic to, to Rude. I think we need the mic on. Uh, yeah. Can anyone there understand yep. me? Yeah. All right. Hi. Ruud Vossenwelt from Inform. Um, yeah, we are a, a software provider, and one of the areas that we uh, are investigating is what can we do with blockchain as part of uh, providing total supply chain visibility yeah, for Finnish vehicle logistics. We believe there is um, very interesting potential. Um, maybe not so much in the area where car makers try to create full visibility for their own supply chain, uh, but much more at the yeah, isolated uh, areas of the total uh, automotive retail market, for example. And what you can imagine, for example, from a car transporter point of view is that there is trading between dealers uh, with cars. And so, yeah, many times the dealers don't know each other that well. And uh, you might maybe use blockchain uh, to connect the dealers and uh, make sure that payments are done correctly eh, between transporters, even when, or between dealers, even when dealers don't know each other uh, that well. Eh, but it gives them at least the trust level and they get some guarantee that the payment is made. And that can already happen when you think about one state or one country. Yeah, but when you think about uh, car trading between different countries or between different continents, then it becomes even more important yeah, to have the trust level. And then uh, you might maybe do trading between, um, let's say, China and the US, and you're sure that this dealer will make his payment when he makes a transport to the US and um, so, and we can imagine that the trading itself can really become, uh, yeah, can accelerate yeah, because uh, a lot of these trust issues are taken away and there is a way to track the process even when you don't have a system yourself, but you can use maybe a blockchain platform that someone is offering you. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, yeah. just to add to that, we're not using blockchain. We're looking at it. I think when you get into the asset side of it, there's definitely applicability, right? So if we want to get into sharing assets and sharing trucks across multiple customers that we don't know who that entity is, or to your point around just the whole carrier process, right, the buy and sell exchange, it should be able to enable that as well. I just think it's a matter of time where it becomes a little bit more popular in mm -hmm. logistics. So what I wanted to ask before, and, and forgot, but now remember, is, is we talk a lot about you know, moving towards real time, but so much about the automotive supply chain logistics is by its kind of nature, batch processes. You, know, you, you get delivery, you process it through. And I mean, EDI by its nature is also a batch process. There's talk about moving towards API, I guess, and doing it more. But A, do we need to, you know, is, is fundamentally, is this a batch kind of based industry and that's just how we are? Uh, and, and, or is there more potential to actually move into something more real time? Um, and, and what would we need to do to get there? Mm -hmm. 
That's an interesting question, and I, I don't know if there's any, um, I mean, I don't claim to be a, um, an IT expert, but I will say what I've seen on some transformation roadmaps recently in, you know, in automotive would, it, it, I think in, in IT terms, they call it um, like a distributed ecosystem, right? You know, which was 15 years ago, it was all about the ERP, yeah. which by definition is, you know, it's yeah. a monolith, right? Yeah. This distributed system is all about, you know, best of breed for this and, and what we need here, best of breed here. And, and then you loosely couple those systems. You, you only integrate those as tightly as you need. And so I guess the short answer is, um, I don't know that um, everything needs to be real time. I don't know that it's inherent necessarily in the industry because of volumes or anything else. Um, maybe there's a legacy, you know, kind of a, a legacy IT hangover that prevents you know, systems in, in many auto players from being more modern by nature. But I don't know that the investment needs to go immediately towards, boy, we ought to be investing in highly connected, you know, all the data is real time kind of systems. Yeah. I think it's selective. Mm. I think it's um, when and where there's value, you do that. Otherwise, um, it's okay that your, your, your system here is somewhat decoupled from your system here. Mm. Yeah, no, I would agree. I think it needs to be selective. I mean, APIs, it's not going away if you don't have an API strategy or way behind. Mm -hmm. I think the, the, the sense of real time, I mean, EDI is latent. I mean, if you look at a 214 status message that we all use in this room, and most of us are moving towards real time GPS updates, a 214 can be hours old, mm -hmm. right? And the concept of a status update is I want to know where it's at right now. I think the real time is more around inventory and manufacturing processes that kind of drive, you know, higher value, right? So if you take about, you know, whether it's on the line and you're making a car, or if you have maintenance issues and trying to predict when maintenance issues will occur or predict when you have enough inventory. So I think the real-time aspect should drive higher value activities. If it's a purchase order, a standing purchase, who cares? Who cares if it's EDI? But I do think the biggest constraint is all of the systems and processes have been geared around legacy systems, and it's really hard for companies to kind of migrate away from them, um, but it's, it's eventually going to happen. I mean, at some point in time, the majority of the EDI transactions aren't needed, mm -hmm. right? You can just take an EDI transact, you still can send it via API. You don't have to go through a van, right? And so that technology is not going away. Whether it's real time or not, I'm, I'm with you. You gotta look at the value equation, and what, even for us on GPS updates, we can ratchet down the tolerance to seconds, to minutes, to hours, and, and typically we look at about a 15 minute ping, because if you go less than that, what value are you getting out of a five minute ping? Well, it just moved, you know, half a mile, moved two miles, it moved three miles. Are you do you really need real time, I need to, need to know where my shipment is or truck on a road, um, or is it near real time? In, in, in seconds, minutes, hours. And I, I think yeah. it's a function of whatever that data element is, is how is it driving improvements on the process? And if it's not, then you don't need real time. Mm -hmm. I was just uh, speaking overnight with, with Audi in Europe a little bit, getting out of the information, but then they were very busy trying to deal with the Mexico, trying to understand what might be happening there. So, I mean, clearly, uh, you're right. I mean, maybe the minute to minute, but but mm -hmm. actually critically down to hours, down perhaps two to half hours. If, do I have two hours of inventory, but I'm not going to get this, you know, sure. now for eight hours or something? This mm -hmm. this obviously is is important for certain yep. roles and, and probably increasingly so. Any any questions from from the audience to jump in right now? We have a question right here in the middle. Mike, coming behind you. Well, I'm David Parker from Cloudleaf. Uh, a question to Kevin, probably a loaded question, but uh, when you're talking to customers and trying to understand from them how to change processes and move to a new age of running their business, whether it's real time or batch, what are the mitigating circumstances that's compelling them to make that shift? Because I'm hearing all the time that cost is a barrier, changing processes is a barrier. I'm just wondering how you educate your customer base on overcoming some of those challenges. Yeah, you know, to tell you the truth, and you've probably lived through this, the, um, you know, investments like that, if you're talking about kind of system investments to move to, we need better integration or real-time integration and so forth, 
they need, they need a business case, right? They need a return on investment. But we also discussed this in the think tank I was part of. Um, it can be really hard to put a value on what's the value of visibility? What's the value of better information for decision making? We know it has value, but how you monetize that? So honestly, you know, I see a lot of, um, just in my purview, I see a lot of investments along those lines made, to, t to be totally transparent with you, not on a classic ROI business case kind of basis, but made on um, uh, avoidance of pain or you know, a sense of opportunity kind of basis. In other words, there's a little bit of, um, there's a little bit of, uh, of, of faith given to you know, the executive sponsor for this opportunity to say, no, I really do think this is gonna drive our upside or drive our cost down or drive this opportunity. I really do think we're gonna have better opportunity that will turn into this. But very seldom do I see any more people, you know, executives um, comfortable, and I understand it, committing to an ROI, a hard ROI return when it comes to systems improvements that are integrative in nature or, um, you know, reducing latency and things like that. Those are just hard investments to make. Where you see the hard um, dollar value attachments are to systems that are driving new capabilities, right? Because, you know, you're creating something where there's nothing. So, you know, I, I don't take this to say this, you know, this Kevin guy told us that business cases aren't important anymore. But the, the hard dollar business case can be really difficult in those IT investment scenarios that you're describing. And a lot of times I think it can be the, the credibility and the influence of the executive sponsor that drives those things forward. Just my experience. Thank you. Gary, you, oh, uh, we'll take a question there. Yeah, Ruud Vos about Inform. Uh, I, will, I would like to add something to that um, thinking about real time and the benefits. Uh, what we see in Europe at least is, and Audi is one of the examples, is that they uh, try to use now as much as they can uh, the smartphone technology, uh, apps on the phone, and which helps them to create much fuller visibility of all trucks going to the factory as a sort of um, Uber uh, idea uh, that trucks, you see them coming into the factory and it helps them to recognize the truck when it arrives at the gate mm -hmm. uh, or at the entry point. They give a quick check-in. It means the truck just can drive in and it goes to the dock and the dock people know already, uh, let's say 10 minutes before, that the truck will arrive in 10 minutes and they are prepared to process the truck immediately. And they save 30 minutes by truck by creating this process. And they have 1,000 trucks a day. So that's a very big business case. Mm -hmm. And we know Volkswagen likes to copy this through to all the factories mm -hmm. because it's a very quick win that they can have with uh, this uh, thinking. We also have another project, and they call it Truck Radar, with uh, a retail company. And this uh, company, they provide solution products to the supermarkets. They use cross docks and they have trucks that go to the cross dock and other trucks that need to go to the supermarkets. And the outbound trucks are not always sure if they can go already because the inbound trucks have not arrived yet. And they are checking if this next truck, this inbound truck is coming in 10 minutes so they can wait, or if this inbound truck will arrive only in two hours. So they have to go already. Yeah, so it's the synchronization that you get between inbound and outbound which also can help to reduce inventories in the cross docks. So in that way, I think there are new possibilities to, yeah, to be more synchronized between inbound and outbound and also to get even leaner cross dock operations if you get that really right. So there might be some areas where uh, there is a quick win. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're, we are experiencing it now. I mean, I gave the example of one of the projects that we're working on, that's exactly it. It's, it's being able to provide proactive ETA around when is my stuff going to arrive so it eliminates waste, you, right? You can do better scheduling. You can also reduce inventory, right? Try to reduce some of the safety stock. I think visibility eventually is just a, a stake at, at the table, right? You have to have it. I think the question on real time, though, is still a bit of a debate, 
right? Because even visibility, you can ratchet it down to seconds and minutes, and you can, I think it's a business rule thing, and then around the cost of the inventory and what's the value. But to me, visibility is a stake at the table to deliver a service. And whether you're a 3PL trucking company or a manufacturer, you have to have that proactive visibility to drive better business decisions. I think the cool thing is getting into predictive stuff, right? So getting into pre predictive maintenance, right? When a, a truck needs to be maintained or, you know, a machine chop needs to be maintained. Um, so the predictive side of it is even more exciting, right? Because on the visibility, we're starting to use contextual data, right? Whether it's going to be weather delays. We're already using traffic to delay to adjust the ETAs, right? And, and and some of that's real time, some of it's you know a few minutes delayed. I think the interesting thing will be how do you use better information to drive even better decisions. I think visibility is just step one, and uh, that's going to be table stakes. Yeah. In our cases, it's not a, the real time really. It's more yeah. geofencing. Like, yeah, right. Uh, that, for example, you check right. ten, 10 minutes before the factory, one that's hour, right. two hour. That's right. And that's why you get alerts at the moment that there is a deviation that's from correct. your ETA. That's correct. Yeah, and what yeah. we see now for Finnish vehicle logistics, that even there are car makers who always had, let's say, one day, two days inventory in their mm -hmm. yards. They even try to see how can they take most of the inventory out right. by synchronizing the output of the factory with trucks coming in right. in the right hour, so that even you don't need to have space anymore for cars to be picked up at right. the factory area. Yep. You know, that's the opportunity. We do something, we also use geofences, we monitor every pickup and departure, stop by stop. I think the fun stuff is then automating it, right? So I, I've talked about predictive, but we have a lot of people on phones. This industry and logistics, we still have people on phones and people on keyboards, right? And a lot of the startups that are coming out right now tend to automate transactions, right? So if somebody's gonna punch a keyboard and say, I just, shipment was picked up, it was delivered, it was dispatched, so a lot of the tasks on the computer, or if exceptions occur, automating those is kind of the next wave, right? And automating to push information then out to an end customer, whether it's somebody in a plant, whether it's finished vehicle, whether it's an end retail customer, that's where it's going, and it's moving pretty quickly down there. On the predictive analytics, again, dinging the buzzwords as we go along, but. Um, <laughs> When, when we talk about an OEM setting up an analytics team and looking at the supply chain, and, and uh, I mean, is it enough in their own networks to do this? Or do, in fact, will the real benefit only really come when that's kind of opened up and, and kind of the data that's looked at across entire networks? Uh, it, it, you know, I mean, is, is, is it really big data if it's just one company, no matter how big, company, big that company is? And do you see signs that OEMs are, are interested and willing to do this, or manufacturers? Yeah, I'll, I'll chime in on that. I, 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 that sounds like a very loaded question, right? Because clearly the answer is um, yes, the data sharing and data visibility across the supply chain is, is where the value comes in. You know, there's been at least three or four times that today that the questions or topics around tracking returnable containers have come up. Um, in the, the, one of the sessions, the small group sessions I was in earlier, we talked about, I guess I referenced it earlier, we talked about tracking um, your, your you know, parts inbound, your freight, um, particularly if it's ocean. Um, and you can't do, you know, no single organization is gonna get very far tracking it from the time I take possession to the time I hand it off to my business partner downstream. So yeah, I think there's no question that that's, um, that, I mean, that's already, that already exists. Uh, I know there's a lot of pain points on that. It's not where it needs to be, but, but um, that's where some of these probably new digital technologies and some of these startups that have a, have a chance at becoming you know, sustainable companies, boy, if they can help with some of that visibility and traceability and trackability end to end, wow, now you got something. Yeah, and I think one other challenge, I mean, you talk about predictive, that, that's a pretty broad space, but from an OEM perspective, uh, yeah, their networks are, are big enough to leverage their own assets, their own capabilities. I think the challenge is they have a lot of partners and providers involved, right? And so you're going to have to rely on some of your providers to deliver uh, different data capabilities, 
but their networks are enormous, right? And they've leveraged those networks and they can leverage them again. I think it's almost flipping where they can use that data to become more dynamic because it's typically been a pretty flat schedule. And so I think once they start being able to utilize that data a little bit better, they could probably become a little bit more dynamic in how they plan, how they buy, how they make you know, vehicles. I think just in general, predictive analytics is, is, is certainly not going away. I think it's a function of where do you start. And I do like the concept of you take your own company, you take your own assets, your own capabilities, and you start there with one particular problem, right? And predictive is, is not easy, right? You, you need a few data scientists and a bunch of data management folks. Um, but it's much easier if you take one problem, right? And whether that's maybe better lane rates, better pricing, maybe predictive pricing based on certain lanes, right? I mean, those are the type of scenarios or solutions you could solve for that get really muddy if you try to extend it across your entire business. Uh, but yeah, for, from an OEM perspective, they have enough volume and mass to certainly leverage that capabilities. But they're going to have to rely on everybody involved in, in that network, whether it's a supplier or a provider. Yeah. Anyone got any comments or questions from the audience? If I could switch gears just slightly to, to, to the NAFTA side of things. Now, I know this may not be anybody's particular area of expertise, but Ryder is obviously an important North American logistics provider with important operations in Mexico, lots of cross-border. Um, and, and Kevin, I mean, if you're looking at any North American supply chain, it would be hard to, to not look cl closely at what's happening in Mexico. If, if, now, I know from uh, Al Sapanta, who's the head of U.S.-Mexico Chamber of Commerce, I know he's very optimistic that the end result will be neutral to beneficial in terms of not having extra trade barriers. But, but if we did see, say, a tariff applied somewhere or extra checks involved or origin, you know, parts of... Um, origins change, increase, become a bit more complex. Uh, from, from the point of view of, of logistics, how big of an impact might we, might we see that? I mean, the, the border isn't exactly the smoothest flow that we have in the supply chain right now. Um, and, and yet we see big growth. OK, there's some questions about a couple of things. But um, I mean, just maybe if we can, if I'm starting from Ryder's perspective a little, where, what, do you, what do you hope will happen here? What do you hope really won't happen? For me yeah, we start yeah, with, yeah. Start with yeah, so I mean, one, I don't think it's going to happen. I, I, I mean, you know, you talked about the vote that's coming up in about a year, and I don't think much will change, to be honest with you. I think it's a lot of posturing. Um, if it does change, I mean, yeah, listen, our, our, our domestic Mexican operations, a lot of our business down there are driven from U.S.-based companies, but we also have a lot of domestic business, right? So for us, if that changes, we're still going to invest in Mexico. It may just shift from cross-border, more just intra-Mexico. We already have a big enough network within Mexico, whether it's a multi-client warehouse and enough just domestic transport that we manage ourselves through partners that we don't see that as changing around not investing in Mexico. I think it will add some complexity. I think the visibility piece is, is key. Um, there's already providers we use around connecting the GPS piece to it. But from our vantage point, it's not going to slow down our investment in Mexico at all. Mm. And in fact, as a contingency, we're going to continue to invest in Mexico proactively. So. Yeah, and I, I can say um, that from an EY perspective, you know, I don't, again, um, claim to be an expert on tax and trade policy either, but I know our, our, our firm has, has kind of publicly said that um, we don't believe there will be significant um, um, degradation of that, of those trade and tariff policies. I mean, I, we are sort of hedging that there isn't a, um, there isn't a, a, a tremendous pullback on you know, on what NAFTA allows today. Um, and so, you know, but who knows? It, stranger things have certainly happened. Um, but that's, that's not what we're betting on. Because at the end of the day, there is so much, um, there is so much entrenched interest, not, not just in our industry, in so many industries, um, that a lot of the rhetoric and so forth that may be going around right now is going to meet with an economic reality, and our, our belief is that um, that economic reality will, will kind of sway decision making. I hope it goes where Rogelio was talking about. Let's look at, um, if you're talking about NAFTA in particular, let's look at Im improving, you know, maybe what isn't working so well in that framework, but not, 
you know, not pulling back. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's, uh, that's where we in this room certainly would hope it would go, um, but obviously we'll be we'll keep keeping a close eye on all this. There's something you might have heard of uh, on our side of the Atlantic as well, which is with Brexit, which is raising some very similar um, points, and uh, not sure that cool heads always prevail on these things, but let's, uh, let, let's hope and see. Um, we, we have the polling that we wanted to do, so um, we'll probably move to that, but I would, would give you as the audience one last chance to, to pose a question uh, if you had a point to make. Uh, otherwise, we'll move to the voting. Um, well, okay, I mean, it's not, it, like I said, the discussions don't end here, and we have a great gala dinner ahead of us now, so we'll continue that. But now, we're going to take a couple of minutes to, to ask you to do some live, live voting, as I mentioned right in the beginning. So just, just a reminder, again, you're going to get sick of hearing us talk about this thing. Um, but um, but, but it, you know, we're quite proud to, that we've kind of moved into our own digital space, I suppose, uh, with, the, with the app. And um, so hopefully you've by now downloaded this. Um, and and if, if you haven't, um, again, instructions are there. Once you have the app, there's on your home screen, there's uh, as a, a, a button called vote. So you just have to click on, click on vote, and that's going to bring up uh, which we'll, we'll start loading the questions in a minute. Um, and, and just to say again, the questions that, that we're kind of putting here, these are similar questions to what we put to our 20th anniversary kind of panel of, of OEM executives. And I've sort of synthesized some of their responses so you can kind of choose. So we're looking a little bit about what's changed over the last 20 years in automotive logistics, what hasn't changed, and, and a little bit about you know, what's to come and what we might expect. So, so kind of in line with the conference, they're, they're meant to be a bit reflective and forward-looking. Uh, so hopefully most of you um, have found your way uh, onto the app and onto the voting, voting page. So then we'll, we'll kick off then with our first question. As I mentioned, um, automotive logistics, we're now 20 years old. Looking forward to have our first beer next year in, in, in the US when we turn 21, <laughs> but in the meantime. So what has been some of the biggest changes to automotive logistics over the past two decades? And again, these, these answers are a little bit what, I, what, I, what our OEM panel said, so you can kind of choose from them. Would you say the biggest change has been the increase in supply chain complexity, like more part numbers, longer, riskier supply chains, globalization, et cetera? Would you say it's been improvements in IT and data visibility across the supply chain? Um, has it been the so-called Amazon effect, the, the impact of e-commerce on expectations for speed, delivery, and variety? Uh, has it been increases in automation of logistics processes? Has it been increased levels of manufacturing and supply chain outsourcing? Or has it been economic and cost pressures on companies, including, for example, consolidations, uh, mergers, and acquisitions? Of course, it's the all of the above, but we're not giving you that option. Um, but if you can choose what you think has been, for your company, your perspective, uh, the biggest factor in the last two decades. So it's a tight race. But uh, we've got a, just nipping it out is the improvements in, in IT and data visibility, uh, just moving ahead of the kind of increase in supply chain complexity. So uh, that goes in line perhaps in what we were just talking about. I think what we also know that the opportunities ahead are, are tremendous here, but uh, there have been improvements, there have been a lot of changes. I should have said in the beginning, I know you're all way too young to actually remember what happened 20 years ago in this industry, but stick with it anyway and give us your perspective. So our next question. So again, what, what hasn't changed as much as you would have expected in, in the past two decades? This is, again, this is the same, this is just slightly shorter, but it's the same, the same options. What hasn't changed the most? Has it been complexity and globalization didn't change as you would have thought? IT systems and visibility, have they not uh, changed or developed as you would have hoped? Again, the expectation for speed delivery, so the Amazon effect. Automation, has it been as much automation or not as you would have thought? Uh, outsourcing or again the, the financial pressures. So what hasn't changed as much as you would have thought it would have? So automation and, and just, just slightly ahead of the IT. So again, the things that have advanced are also the things which haven't advanced, funnily enough, but uh, um, that, that's pretty much in line with what we've heard from, from OEMs as well. 
um, in terms of at least uh, logistics processes have been stayed relatively manual at the level of, you know, at the shop floor level anyhow, uh, and certain, certainly with transport side. So um, automation and IT still areas not as developed as maybe we might have thought. 20 years ago, people would have been talking about RFID, for example. Is there a question? There's something going on. So next question. How have order to delivery lead times evolved for the products that you manage in the supply chain compared to 20 years ago? Would you say order to delivery times are broadly similar? Would you say order to delivery times have mainly increased? Would you say they have decreased? Or actually, you just can't really compare with 1997 given the changes in the, in the supply chain? So that's pretty clear from, from this audience here. 46% think that they have decreased. I, I sort of left it open for you to sort of choose which ones we're talking about relative to your business. But um, for the most part, we're looking at decreased, although um, quite a few of you, a third, think actually that the, there's no real comparison to make um, over, or with, with the past in that regard. So next question. So how do you think manufacturers, OEMs, tier suppliers, how do you think they view logistics today compared to 20 years ago? Would you say today logistics is valued more as a strategic and competitive factor than in the past? Is it considered more, but mainly as a waste that needs to be reduced, so it's actually just more expensive as opposed to maybe a strategic uh, factor? Would you say nothing has changed, it was always pretty highly valued, it's still, value high, still uh, highly valued, or indeed nothing has changed? because it was never really valued and it's still not valued. So a couple of options there for, for how you think uh, manufacturers view logistics now compared to the past. So again, kind of a, a pretty positive to see that, 56% think that it's now more of a strategic asset to, to companies. That's certainly the answer we would hope, but um, um, a pretty large share also think it's maybe it's just the cost factor that's playing it. Um, nobody thought it was particularly highly valued in the past, but uh, uh, at least we were seeing some change on that. So next question. So now looking ahead a little bit, what do you anticipate will be the biggest impact over the next decade? So is it, will it be the, the increase in the sales and production of alternative powered vehicles? Will it be the move toward high level autonomous vehicles? I guess that's level four, level five. Um, would it be the development of, of real time visibility throughout the supply chain? Will it be the use of, of big data and predictive analytics? This is the slide where I try to get all the buzzwords in as well um, to forecast uh, and, and influence business decisions. Would it be advanced automation of logistics? We haven't talked about it too much so far, but, but actual advances, co robots, things like that. Or increases in, in e-commerce uh, for automotive. So what, what do you anticipate some of the bigger impact on the supply chain for the next decade? So about a third of you um, picking up what we maybe we talked about a little bit in this session, about a third of you see big data and predictive analytics as, as, uh, as some of the big, uh, the big issues. Obviously, that is a broad area, but, um, but looking at that, 20% 20, 20 see the, the increase in, in alternative power vehicles as playing a big role. And we talked about that in, in, a, in a think tank. Obviously, there are significant changes that that, that, that could bring to the supply chain. So next question, how significant a role will environmental sustainability play in the future supply chain? Very significant role, increasing, uh, sorry, reducing emissions and pollution will become a, both a regulatory and a competitive imperative. So significant, driven perhaps by regulation and some economic benefits. Uh, neutral, maybe somewhat significant today, some, creases, some increase in regulation, but, but ultimately outweighed by other factors or actually not terribly significant. So no, not, not really making, uh, playing a factor in making supply chain decisions. So 
so significant. Obviously, the big overwhelming fee, significant or very significant. So I think that's a pretty clear, um, that's a pretty clear vote of, of confidence that this is the direction the industry is and, and has to move. I don't know if the spate of hurricanes is convincing us or, or if, if it will be regulation or what it is. It doesn't matter. But, uh, but clearly, green supply chains are an important, important part of uh, this business in the future. And then I, I believe this is our, our last question. So coming maybe on the human resources uh, skills side. So what, what will be the most important skills for supply chain managers in the coming decade compared to the past? Is it going to be deep IT and systems understanding and knowledge? Will it be total supply chain comprehension? So looking beyond, say, your, your silo of the supply chain into understanding across. Uh, again, the analytics, data analytics. Uh, risk and crisis management skills. Again, we can talk about what's going on in the world consistently right now. Or actually, do you think the skill set will be broadly the same as in the past or as it is, as it is today? So um, give us your view on, on what the future supply chain management needs to needs to understand and do. Wow, so quite a overwhelming there, the total supply chain comprehension. And I think that maybe the, to put that into buzzword terms, the ecosystem, uh, yeah. right? The, uh, or ecosystem platform, but the, the view across, across all the inf influencing factors. And I think that's quite a, a, good, a good vote here from, from our audience and, uh, and, and an interesting end to, to this session. Um, obviously, uh, we talked about the role analytics will play. Um, but I think that's something that's going to drive a lot of organizations and, and companies. So um, thank you for that. That's our, that was our, our last question on the live. It just uh, gives us a little bit of, uh, of, of your view on this. Like I mentioned, some of that will be in our 20th anniversary issue, which is going to come out next month in a couple of weeks um, with, with our view from the industry of, of what's changed and what hasn't. Um, a thanks again to our panel for, for, their, for their discussion and for their inputs, and, and thank you for your questions today and, and in this session and before. Um, as I mentioned, we're now going to go to the Ryder hosted gala dinner at the Detroit Institute of the Arts. Um, again, we'll have buses leaving from the Marriott lobby. Uh, that's on the first floor, so just take the elevator down. And we'll, we'll have a couple of coaches uh, going over the next, I suppose, 15 minutes or so. So head down there um, as soon as you can, and we'll, we'll get you over there. Otherwise, we'll see you over there and look forward to a great night and tomorrow morning, bright and early. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Thanks.